we have this initial tax savings that's going to be money that returns to you immediately and that has to be factored in to the return on investment in the form of tax savings on top of the cash flow. Welcome to the Wealth Strategy Secrets of the Ultra Wealthy Podcast, where we help entrepreneurs like you exponentially build wealth through passive income to live a life of freedom and prosperity. Are you tired of paying too much in taxes, gambling your future on the stock market, and want to learn about hidden strategies for making your money work for you? And now your host, Dave Wolcott, serial entrepreneur and author of the best-selling book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy. Hey everyone, and welcome to today's show on Wealth Strategy Secrets. Today we're joined by Mark Perlberg. Mark is a CPA and certified tax planner dedicated to helping real estate investors and entrepreneurs reach their financial objectives through strategic tax planning. Since becoming a CPA in 2015, he has assisted hundreds of entrepreneurs since 2019, achieving tax savings up to two and a half million in a single year through advanced planning techniques. Mark and his team work closely with clients to understand their unique goals and circumstances, thoroughly evaluating past, present, and future financial events to guide them toward the best business and financial decisions. With tax time upon us, I really wanted to have Mark on the show to reveal some advanced tax strategies that you might be able to deploy in 2024 to lower your taxes. If you've been enjoying the show, please be sure to subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And please share it with your network so they can accelerate their own journeys. And now for today's show. Mark, welcome to the show. Hey, Dave, thanks for having me. Yeah, you bet. Really grateful to have you on the show, Mark. I find that this area of tax planning can be so vexing for so many people. And so many people really just don't even understand the possibilities of proper tax planning. And, you know, I, I think that that is the challenge, right? Is you don't know what you don't know. But, you know, before we kind of jump into your background and everything, why don't why don't we really start there, right? Help the audience really understand what is the difference from you know traditional tax planning versus proactive tax planning, and and talk to us about a little bit about the industry. Yeah, so you know I I would say that most people are being underserved by their advisors or, or their their preparers. Um, you know most firms are what I call ten forty factories and tell you what you owe, and then if you decide to engage in tax planning, there's a whole spectrum of opportunities and complexities here. And I say, I would say that, you know, we say, we talk about proactive and basic tax planning here and, and what's, what's the difference and, and what kinds of tax planning is there? So, you know, depending on your levels of complexity and how much income and potential tax liabilities we're dealing with here is going to impact what's, what, what level of, of involvement and engagement are you going to need from a tax advisor here. So let's say you're making, you know, like 100, 150 in an S corp. Yeah, you can have some conversations and do some basic tax planning and, you know, maybe put some money into an, a retirement account or have some investments and some, some more basic features. But then when we move into seven figures of profit, now we start to see bigger tax problems to solve, which introduces more complex and more interesting and unique opportunities. So we move um, from a spectrum of well, if you're if you you know at the low end, if you're making like maybe sixty thousand at your W two, there's not really a whole lot of tax planning. You know, maybe some ba basic investment decisions to some you know foundational business ideas for entrepreneurs. But then at, at the other side of the spectrum, when we have significant income or really big capital gain events or exits. Now we have to have a fully immersive tax plan. And we're looking at all the different sources of income and how they all impact each other today, in the past, and in the future to diagnose a strategy that's going to overall minimize your taxes now and in the future, prevent future taxation, to protect yourself from overtaxation and also your heirs and your family members. Yeah. And what would you say from an industry perspective? Is it is it maybe 5% of CPAs are really proactive tax planners? You know, I, I would say less than that because it's just the profession has, 
you know, you get your, you know, I work my tail off for my CPA and I learned, you know, I learned a lot and I use it, but it taught me how to help clients stay out of trouble and stay compliant. You know, it helped, you know, the CPA profession and most firms are, are helping you understand what you owe in taxes and, and keeping you out of trouble and making your quarterly payments. But, you know, after the book is closed and the year has ended, there's not, there's not a whole lot you can do. There are some things you can do, but you're very limited. And if you're not designed to be proactive, if your model doesn't allow for it in the way you service clients and even how you charge for your services, you're just at a certain income threshold, you're just leaving so much opportunity on the table for the clients. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, I think it's really all starts with education, which is what, you know, we talk about a lot here. And, you know, this really wasn't taught to us anywhere in schools or no matter, you know, what, what your uh, profession is. They don't really talk about tax planning. They don't talk about wealth creation the way it should be done. And, you know, sadly, a lot of us, especially me, I have so many war wounds uh, with tax planning and having to pay very large, you know, six figure uh, tax bills for years. And then See it all the time to, yeah, just trying to, you know, figure out, you know, what is the solution? And luckily, I had enough persistence to know that there was a solution out there. And there were uh, people like you, uh, proactive tax planners that could kind of help uh, to do that. And and why this is so important is because uh, so many of us investors, right, we're always trying to think about how can we grow our wealth, right? Um, and where can we get access to additional capital? And I find that this is one of the biggest areas, right, with low hanging fruit that you can tap, untap potential, right, of free capital that instead of paying to Uncle Sam, right, you could divert into a proper tax strategy. Yeah, you know, I, you know, I, the way I kind of got into this was I was really bored at my corporate job and I wanted to use real estate to get out of it originally. And I hung out on real estate investors. I was a CPA and they're like, how can you, you know, how, what can you do to help me with my, my taxes? Why am I paying so much? And I was like, I got to know this. Like, there's no way I'm hiring anyone else to do my taxes if I busted my tail to get that license. And so, I, you know, I researched and obsessed over the tax code and tax planning. And I realized that before even real estate, the best for, for a high income is the best possible investment you'll ever make is into tax planning because when you like with real estate, sure, you know, a good cap rate, you know, IRR might be 20%, right? That's a really good rate, but a tax plan is going to save you any tip, a decent tax plan is going to save you typically anywhere from five to 10 times your investment. So I don't know t too many vehicles where you can invest $10,000 to save 50,000 or you know, a hundred thousand to save half a million dollars in taxes, and and, and tax savings is untaxed. So if, if you save fifty thousand in taxes, for most of the people listening, that's like your that's the equivalent of earning after taxes seventy you know seventy five seventy thousand dollars of income. So it is incredibly crucial. And then what do you do with your tax savings? You invest into the real estate, the IULs, the alternative assets, the life insurance. You know all these other vehicles and private placements and, and all this exciting stuff with tax with the tax savings to grow in a tax advantage manner but certainly uh, that's going to be some of your lowest hanging fruit because it's, pr it's predictable a lot of these vehicles and it's just incredible how this can cut off years of your uh, off your goals to retire quit your job or whatever you, your goal is that's going to require capital yeah, well said. And I, you know, I think a lot of this is mindset too, right? So, you know, you, you, you made a really key distinction there, right? Which is, you know, if I can get a five or 10 X return on the amount of tax planning I do, right? That's, that's really huge, but we don't really typically look at tax planning as an investment opportunity. Most people see it as an expense. And Many of those out there, especially who are doing this as DIY, even right, doing your own taxes, you know, you're just really leaving money on the table, right? You have to start seeing things as investments, 
And when you can invest in those, right, then you can get a, a higher ROI on it. And in addition to that, I think what's powerful from, you know, what you said, Mark, is, you know, that five or 10 X return you were talking about only annually. And what I love about when you create an actual strategy is this really compounds on itself, right? Because when, when you have that strategy in place, it's going to be in place for subsequent years. Oh, absolutely. And that's why you want to really have that strong initial foundation. And that's, you know, if, if you have the right person who you invest in your relationship with and you've really captured everything possible, you know, not just some of the things you'll see online like cost segregation, but what other things are out there like, enti- you know, some advanced entity structuring and, and things that are lesser known like alternative investments and all these other features. So you can maximize that savings and it'll really compound year after year. Uh, It's like, and and sometimes you take your tax savings and can reinvest it into other things that further drive down your taxes. So we see a snowballing effect by which we, we, we put our money into things that reduce our taxes. We take our savings and put into other things that further drive down the taxes and, and generate revenue and profit and wealth. So it's just amazing how this can all compound and snowball over time. To, to in, impact the lives of people looking to build wealth. Yeah. Can you give us some examples of some of the most impactful strategies? Yeah. So, you know, uh, I'm wondering here now what kind of audience we're, lo- we're, we're talking to here because there's some stuff that is very well known, but I'll tell you um, short-term rental investing or real estate professional tax status has been very impactful for a lot of our clients because, you know, especially when we had bonus depreciation at 100% and we may get it again, there were clients who were putting 10% down on their these short-term rentals and they were buying these furnished cabins. And because the cabins were furnished, there was a lot of depreciation we could take up front on, you know, the, the furniture and the TVs and the linens. Imagine paying $100,000. Let's say we pay eighty. $80,000 on an $800,000 short-term rental and get a, a tax deduction of a quarter million. So the savings would p- cover your down payment. And then you get cash flow and appreciation offset by future depreciation. And you take your tax savings and, and that can serve as another down payment in another rental. So we've seen a lot of clients just do amazing things by taking advantage of the available real estate tax planning opportunities. Um, now they've become a little bit commoditized and popularized by people who came a little bit after, you know, when we started doing this in 2019, but then all the dentists and doctors caught on and now these things became a little overpriced and bonuses phased down. They're still really powerful and we love it. We do it all the time, but now a lot of our clients are taking a lot of interest in oil and gas because they, they realize they don't want to be landlords anymore. Uh, so oil and gas. And then we also have. Um, so we have a lot of clients doing that and also some more sophisticated charitable deduction vehicles where, um, there are different ways by which the charitable deduction is in excess. The charitable savings, the savings from the vehicle is in excess of the costs to create the savings. So, uh, there are instances where we can create massive charitable tax deductions as well. Yeah, no, appreciate those, Mark. And um, I'll put out a, a, a shameless plug here. We actually just launched a, a new oil and gas opportunity uh, really to help investors right, manage some of those taxes. But I think this is a really a, a new asset class uh, to many people. So can you help kind of break down how IDCs work and tangible drilling costs and really how does that work in the in the tax code for people who aren't familiar with it? Yeah, so I'm very enthusiastic about oil and gas uh, investing and the, the tax savings opportunities. And it goes really well with real estate as well. It's a really cool combination here. But when you invest in the working interest into these wells, typically you'll get an intangible drilling cost deduction of 80 to 90% of your contribution into the fund. Now, there are other funds that will give you less and other funds that give you higher amounts. But we ballpark it at 80 to 90% of the money that leaves your pocket to invest into this oil and gas project. That's going to be an ordinary loss, meaning a non-passive loss, meaning it can offset your W-2 income or your business income. And it can offset as much as 610000 if you're married filing joint or half of that amount, 305 I believe it's right around that amount for 24. It sometimes changes if you are single. 
So we can really take a big chunk out of your taxable income. We can eliminate potentially all of your business income. We can even uh, chip away at your FICA taxes with the oil and gas. And the thing that I also really like about this is that compared to real estate, the cash flow can be very rapid in that you know, we see clients getting their money back in the form of cash flow a little faster than real estate. You can't do cash out refis, but we see the money coming in relatively quickly on these things. And so when you combine the initial tax savings and the cash flow, uh, the clients are getting a lot of their money back pretty quickly from these investments so they can reinvest. And uh, when you actually start receiving the cash flow from these oil and gas investments, it's treated as passive income. So we have the best of both worlds. We can offset our FICA and offset our federal taxes and use that to offset the W-2 income and the business income. But when the money starts coming in, it's passive. So we don't pay FICA taxes. We also can use real estate rental losses to offset it as well. So there's a lot of cool stuff going with oil and gas. And then there's some really advanced strategies. So we love looking at oil and gas as an additional feature for our clients. Yeah. And I think it can be confusing for investors like looking at multiple different opportunities across different asset classes too. So talk to us a little bit about how should an investor really interpret, right? Like say on an IRR basis with the tax savings into something like oil and gas, right? You know, how, how do you, let's say if you were to invest $100,000 into an opportunity, you got that 80 to 90% of the tax offset, you know, how, how do you really quantify that even back of the napkin, right? For people evaluating an investment. Yeah. So these are conversations we have with our clients and you no, know, we're not financial advisors. So we can't say with absolute certainty that they're going to get X number of returns. So some of that is, you know, going to be their analysis and they're going to work with people who they trust and who have integrity and a good background. And we make, we can help clients sometimes make some of those intros, but we help them understand what is the impact of this tax deduction here. So, you know, we have this initial tax savings that's going to be money that returns to you immediately. And that has to be factored in to the return on investment in the form of tax savings on top of the cash flow. Hey, it's Dave Walcott here. Let me ask you something. Are you tired of the same old financial advice that leaves you spinning your wheels? If you're ready to discover the real secrets the ultra wealthy use to build unstoppable wealth, then I've got something just for you. My new book, The Holistic Wealth Strategy, is your ticket to learning the proven strategies that the top 1% don't want you to know. This book isn't just about money. It's about building a life of purpose, freedom, and lasting impact. And I want to give you a free copy. Visit holisticwealthstrategy.com and get yours today. It's time to level up your financial game and create the future you deserve. Yeah, that makes sense. Any other uh, strategies that you can share that have been some of the most impactful, especially you know, where, where we are, I guess, I guess we're not really sure what's going to happen with depreciation with 1031 kind of going into uh, next year, but uh, any, any thoughts there? Yeah. So with bonus appreciation phase outs, and we've kind of structured our practice in anticipation of the phase outs for the past few years, because we knew if that was all we were counting on was, you know, was uh cost seg and bonus depreciation, we would run out of ideas for our clients. So you know, once we've so once we've attacked that AGI, you know, sometimes we'll look at other ways and strategizing on how we can create sources of bonus depreciation. Maybe buying equipment, renting equipment has been a very popular strategy for a few of our higher income clients, where you could finance equipment and rent it out, and we could facilitate that. Uh, so imagine you know writing off six times your costs to buy and rent out equipment. Um, once we've looked at those types of ways to just reduce your taxable income and create losses. Then we advance to some some more complex or more more unique vehicles here past the oil and gas. So there are ways that where our clients are investing in real estate that actually create charitable tax deductions. So you can invest in real estate with something that's called a historical uh, preservation easement. So this is an instance where you can write off two and a half times your contribution into the real estate as a charitable tax deduction 
and still see some cash flow and depreciation. There are charitable land donations. Now, this stuff has to be done right. You have to work with people who understand the law, but those are effective ways to get, create charitable deductions. There, We are also exploring solar tax strategies where you, you, you're you using leverage to access solar equipment you rent out, and then you get tax credits. You get bonus depreciation, and the tax credits can you be, actually be used to carry back and offset prior year taxes in certain circumstances. So you're using other people's money, you're using leverage and get an immediate tax credit and depreciation. And then there are other ways we can create charitable deductions using leverage that are very appealing to some of our clients in the high brackets. Yeah. All right. You just brought up uh, two points that also I think can be confusing for investors and should be key considerations to keep in mind. So one of them is recapture. Mm -hmm. And can you kind of explain at a high level how recapture really works for some of these investments and, and how are people just really supposed to kind of, you know, keep that in terms of their planning and forecasting and modeling? Yeah, absolutely. Now, if you are using the losses, and so we most often discuss this with real estate because you got a lot of depreciation. If you're able to use those losses as non-passive to offset your ordinary income. So if you have rep status or short-term rentals, eventually when you sell this and you, you're going to sell it for more than you purchase most of the times, it's like the IRS says, well, you wrote all this stuff up, but then you sell it for a higher price. So you got to recapture these losses and pay t treat it as income and, and reverse these tax deductions essentially. So imagine a cost segregation study created $300,000 of tax deductions. Well, you're going to create an additional $300,000 of taxable income when it's sold uh, in a capital gain event if there's no planning. And any amount of tax deductions created from those cost segregation studies are going to be taxed at your ordinary rate. So it could be a major tax hit if we don't, if we don't plan. Now, the recapture of the regular depreciation isn't taxed as much. The depreciation of the building is also recaptured, but it's capped at 25%. So it's not as bad, but it still can be quite a tax trap if we, we don't plan for it. Yeah. And then also, can you explain to people about how to um, carry forward losses work, both on the active and passive side, so people are clear with that? Yeah. So if we have losses that are unused and carry forward for any reason, uh, they can, if they're passive losses from real estate, which we see a lot of when people are investing in syndications and things of that nature, they're going to carry forward and they're only going to offset other passive income. And by the way, oil and gas, if, you, if it's operating at a profit, is passive income. But it'll offset passive income and it can also offset real estate capital gains. Now, let's say we have ordinary losses, non-passive losses. Your business operates at a loss. Maybe that's because you have access to lots of equipment purchases or maybe you just had an unprofitable year. Those ordinary losses are going to carry forward those non-passive losses and they're going to be a little easier to use because they're going to offset your, they're going to be treated as just regular non-passive losses to offset your other sources of income, but it's going to be capped at 80% of your AGI. Got it. Yeah, no, I think that's uh, really helpful pe for people to understand that. And in my experience, that's again, where a lot of it is very beneficial to have this proactive planning in place, right? When you have different liquidity events from different investments, uh, different things that are happening and how you can align those, you know, uh, you know, losses carrying them forward to that liquidity event, right? Or the opposite, right? Which is in a year that you don't have much income, let's say, then those are the times that you want to have take that, ta you know, capital gains hit, right? Because you don't have as much income. Oh, yeah. So, and we, you know, you heard me talk about it a couple of weeks ago. It's all about timing when we want these expense and revenue events to happen here to optimize your tax savings. So, you know, we love taking advantage of the $0 long-term capital gains bracket if we can drive it that low. Um, and also, like, if, if, let's say you can't take advantage of all these exciting reduction strategies for real estate, but you still want to invest in real estate. Well, you could still build up this reserve of losses that are going to be activated so you can, you can offset and maybe have a tax-free capital gain. 
from maybe some syndication investments or your own investments without having to worry about 1031 exchanges or any other vehicles. So there, there's still a lot of value in understanding and, and having these these loss carry forwards. Yeah. Now, you mentioned that, Mark, um, and, and I was, uh, Mark had uh, done a, a fantastic uh, presentation that I had the opportunity to see um, in one of the mastermind groups that we're uh, members of. And are there any case studies uh, from that presentation or anything else that you think would be helpful for people to, to impart to them? Yeah, you know, so I think that well, I'm trying to think what would be most applicable. We talked about exit planning and we eliminated like the taxes on a $16 million uh, transaction with some planning and timing of expenses. The other topics that I think would be relevant here is we had a loss for a client and we took advantage of that loss by doing a Roth conversion. So we took an IRA that would have been taxed in the future. We converted it into the Roth and now it's going to grow tax-free and is you're eventually is going to compound year after year and potentially create millions of dollars in untaxed wealth by just taking advantage of that low tax bracket. So I think if we can ever do that for for the audience, that's fantastic. And then we also talked about a client where there were some timing strategies where the client needed to create some tax deductions. So we strategized on how we can purchase some equipment. We did some cost segregation studies as well. And we opened up some opportunities with tax deductions and asset purchases to actually create new sources of revenue. Yeah. Yeah. No, it was really a fantastic explanation of, you know, what I would call stacking all oh, yeah. of these tax moves right together. And again, that compounding, you know, effect of all of those things, all of these moves, one on top of the other, on top of the other. Again, we have to keep you know, in our minds, right? It's not how much money you make, it's how much money you keep is what's, you know, what's really important. So where do you think, uh, Mark, in your, in your opinion, are the biggest mistakes that uh, business owners and investors make when it comes to tax planning? You know, I, I, I think that that's a, good, that's a good question. I think that, la I think just lack of education and, you know, not having the right team behind them. If we're, if we're making a high income here, you got to understand when you've outgrown your accountant. So most of us start with rather modest beginnings and maybe we don't need tax planning. Maybe what we really need is just an extra credit card to cover our overhead when we're starting off. But when you reach certain thresholds, your needs increase and you're, you, that also means you got to start increasing the qualities and your investments into the right tax services. So your your accountant may have been wonderful for you, and maybe they were a great fit when you were netting one hundred fifty thousand, half a million a year. But now you're netting a million, two million, three million, and this accountant is not really designed to give you the type of support and tax planning you need at this new level. So it's really about making sure. Yes, I think education is incredibly important, and is. You know, listening to shows like yourself can educate yourself on, oh, I can reduce my taxes with oil and gas. But having someone who's dedicated their life and put thousands of hours into reducing people's taxes just like you is going to create such an impact. And, and that's really what I see a lot of people missing because they just haven't had the opportunity to be exposed to the resources of tax professionals that can share these ideas. Yeah, that's such a great point, right? Is that there's really this period, you know, I would say of leveling, right? As your as your wealth increases, um some of the strategies and things that you're doing just, you know, continue to grow, right? You you really outpace some of your existing advisors, right, that are supporting you. Um, and we often see that so many times where, oh, I've had a relationship with my CPA for 20 years and they go golfing together. You've got a great relationship. Um, but you really have to keep in mind that some of these advanced strategies, right, you're, you're not going to be able to access, you know, with, you know, some of those uh, legacy type relationships, right? And you want to be working with people that are going to take you to the next level that have the experience uh, really to do that. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's hard for people because this is a very important relationship here. It's not a commodity. 
Like these people are going to know all about your stuff and your family and your money. And they make decisions that are going to shape the rest of your life. And you may really trust it and like this person. And maybe this accountant is your family friend or, you know, friend of your spouse or whatever. And this is a close and important relationship. And then we get to the point. So we have all, we have, we really like these people and they're great people. And then it's hard to realize that because of this, we're losing hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in taxes because it's just not an effective relationship anymore. So, you know, you got to think clearly and critically about these relationships when it comes to tax planning and what's the best for you and your family long term. What's the most challenging tax scenario you helped a client navigate and what made it so complex? Well, I think we, we, did an, we did an exit where there was like an F reorg. There was all these different moving pieces going on. So we had like a restructuring, an F reorg. We had all this real estate being purchased at the same time. And we had like a month and a half to plan for it. So that's one example. I mean, there were all these other you know challenging intercompany transactions we had to make sense of in like a month and a half. So that was probably an example of where um, we were just thrown into the fire and had to come up with a solution right away by doing projections and really collaborating with the client and expediting some meetings to make sure we could do anything possible to eliminate taxes before year end. So I would say that would probably be one of our more more complicated situations because exit planning is just, when someone sells their business, there's just so many variables to consider in different directions you can go and with capital gains planning. Yeah, that's that is such a great one, um, and I experienced such a similar challenge uh, when I went through exit planning um, previously. And if anyone out there has an exit at any point in the future, this is this is one more reason it is so critical to have a great advisor on your team, uh, because again, the people that you get referred to in the traditional, you know, circumstances are. Sure, your financial advisor is going to say, "Yeah, I've got a CPA. He's done, you know, lots of exit planning, right?" But all I can tell you is, ninety-eight percent of the industry is based on this conventional thinking, right? Which is all more of that Wall Street type thinking. They're going to give you basically the you know standardized type of approach, and they're not going to be thinking around alternative assets, alternative strategies, just like you were talking about. So I I was really lucky and fortunate enough to have had a relationship in place with my CPA, you know, in advance, and he was a very key member of that you know entire negotiation. Oh yeah, it's so important. And also, here's a you want to talk about a, a missed opportunity here that a lot of people miss is they don't do tax planning before this the negotiations and sales of their businesses. It's like there's so much that could have been done or and should have been done. I mean, as soon as you think about selling it and and have those conversations, the CPA has to be right next to you and involved in these conversations because there, there's just so much. There are so many variables considered with timing and expenses and structuring. It's just such a critical part of this to make sure that you can actually keep the funds from the sale of your business. Yeah. Mark, we had the opportunity to sit down with Tom Wheelwright um, actually just a few weeks ago, talk about uh, the impact of taxes uh, with the upcoming election. Do you have any uh, thoughts um, either way from a you know bipartisan standpoint uh, in terms of you know what either party would bring to the table? What should investors be thinking about right now? Yeah, so I think a lot of this this is all speculative here. I did a whole webinar when Joe Biden was elected to talk about planning for his tax changes. And I would say maybe 5 to 10% of the content was useful looking back because none of it happened. <laughs> you know, they, we were in talks of getting rid of QBI deductions and 1031s, and he didn't really get a whole lot done. I mean, there was the Inflation Reduction Act. But, you know, so we're just speculating here. I think that the, some of the stuff we hear from Kamala Harris and taxing unrealized gains is, is never, I don't think it's ever going to happen. It's going to be impractical. And even if it does, there's going to be so many workarounds, it's going to be ineffective. Now, there were discussions of us bringing back bonus depreciation and the bill was shot down. Now, 
a lot of people suspect that it was the Republicans that didn't want to give the Democrats a victory, which is was which is why we didn't get that beautiful bonus depreciation. In you know, they didn't want to give a victory out right before in an election year. So there's speculation that there's no more reason not to bring back bonus depreciation if Trump wins or even if Kamala Harris wins. And some other things I'm thinking about here is I think qualified opportunity zones are going to be back and they're going to be stronger because they're nonpartisan. I think a lot of people overlook all the cool things we can do with qualified opportunity zone funds. And I suspect that we're going to get back some more of that partial step up and extend the deferral of the capital gains with future qualified opportunity zone funds. I don't think they're going to go away. I think it's, a, it's an underappreciated strategy. And my thoughts are, and hopes are that's going to be really powerful in the future. Yeah. Yeah. No, good point. You know, I, I think it is all speculative, right? And, uh, you know, they use it as, as fodder really between, between the parties and a lot of things have to ha- have to happen for it, um, really to be instantiated in the law, right. And be changed. Are there any other, uh, things, you know, that again, investors really should, uh, be aware of, right. Especially if you're considering some type of investment right now, you know, be it year end or going into next year, or you're considering, you know, retirement or exit planning, um, you know, any other changes in the tax law that, that we want to keep on our horizon. Yeah, so you know we're gonna see at least the way we see it projected now is bonus appreciation is gonna phase down to forty percent. So a lot of these investment vehicles where your the depreciation is such a big component of it, it'll be a little less valuable. Still, at the same time, if you're right, if you get five year life property depreciating, it's still pretty good. So you know if you if you if you're looking at things like ATMs and equipment for depreciation, they're still gonna be pretty good. Not as good, but pretty good. Um, and you know, you'll still get that future depreciation. So in the following years are good with real estate, those cost eggs create 15 year life property. So losing the bonus on that is going to be a little more painful for real estate bonus depreciation. Um, now there's a lot of talk. I think both parties are talking about, you know, strategies to increase fracking and which will, and, and efforts to drive down prices of oil and gas. So I'm curious to see how that may impact oil and gas investing. I don't know. Uh, I, I'm, I'm just curious to see what we're thinking about here. But also with all this, this turmoil internationally and, and Russia and Ukraine, that's going to increase price of oil and it may be favorable for oil and gas investing. So um, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in that environment as well. Uh, so, But I, at the end of the day, you want to be proactive, have the right people around you. If you work with people with experience and integrity and use foundational investing decisions in the long run, regardless of economic factors and things you can't control, you, you should you should be able to make out all right. Yeah. Mark, if you could give just one piece of advice to the listeners about how they could accelerate their own wealth trajectory, what would it be? I would say, the, so this is, a, this is not financial, but I think... You want to surround your pe- yourself with people who inspire you and have a mentor because the best, the best investment you're going to make. Now, I, I love talking about, I'm very enthusiastic about real estate, oil and gas and, and all these other vehicles out there. But the best investment I've ever made and you can never make in yourself is in your own development and education and having a mentor and someone who you aspire to be like. And that's going to grow. That's going to create an ROI maybe even greater than a lot of the tax planning strategies out there if you have a really good mentor. Outstanding. Well, really appreciate you coming in today, Mark. Uh, It's been a wealth of wisdom and we can never, you know, get enough learning about taxes. So appreciate you sharing that. And I know you guys are always busy, (laughs) constantly Mm -hmm. busy, but you know, this education is needed, right? Uh, Again, we weren't really taught uh, about taxes, about, you know, tax law. And when investors really understand that the tax code is actually a series of incentives for business owners and you know, um, investors, right? Then we can understand how to deploy our capital most efficiently. And then, like you said, you know, if you can get a five to 10 X return through proper tax planning, there's some low hanging fruit there. So, so again, really appreciate uh, your time and 
if people want to uh, reach out to you, uh, Mark, and connect with you guys to to learn more, um, what is the best place? Yeah, so you can find me anywhere if you just type Mark Pearlberg CPA. But the best place to find our resources and learn more about us is our website, Prosperal CPA. Prosper with an L. So P R O S P E R L C P A dot com. We have lots of free resources. We have courses. We even give a free custom video if you fill out a survey that takes a couple seconds and, and we'll actually answer your questions. We have all these, um, we have free open calls as well right now going on Wednesday at 3 p.m. You can just hop on in. No sales pitches. We just like geeking out on taxes. It gives us content for the YouTube page. So we love engaging with people interested in this stuff, answering questions and hearing your ideas and sharing ideas. Awesome. Thanks so much, Mark. Appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much for having me, Dave. Thanks for listening to this episode of Wealth Strategy Secrets. If you'd like to get a free copy of the book, go to holisticwealthstrategy.com. That's holisticwealthstrategy.com. If you'd like to learn more about upcoming opportunities at Pantheon, please visit pantheoninvest.com. That's pantheoninvest.com. Dot com.